Podolsky, and I want to welcome you back to the first uh, departmental seminar series event of the spring semester. And we're especially proud to start off with this session. There'll be 90 minutes. And we often speak of crossing disciplines in our pursuit of social medicine informed global health efforts. And when appropriate, are reaching out and collaborating beyond our department to achieve such goals. Today's session exemplifies such work across disciplines and across schools, and we'll focus on the social technologies for the global aging and elder care project in China. And it's no accident that this work has been catalyzed by its PI, Dr. Arthur Kleinman. We'll hear from Arthur and then from his collaborators, Fawaz Habal, Hang Tu Chen, and Eric Krakauer. Very briefly, Arthur Kleinman is the Esther and Sidney Rat Professor of Anthropology at Harvard University, and Professor of Medical Anthropology in Global Health and Social Medicine, and Professor of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, and has been a scholar on China since the 1970s. Fawaz Habal is a senior lecturer in applied physics and the executive dean for education and research at the Harvard School of Applied Engineering of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Hang Tu Chen is an assistant professor of psychiatry here at HMS in our Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. And Eric Krakauer is an associate professor of global health and social medicine here at Harvard Medical School, an attending physician in the Division of Palliative Care and Geriatrics at MGH, and director of MGH's Global Palliative Care Program. We'll hear from them in turn with Arthur moderating, and we'll have time for questions from the audience, which you're welcome to submit through the Q&A function. With that, I'll hand this over to Arthur. Thank you, Scott. Um, so as you have heard, I'm, I'm Arthur Kleinman. I have been a member of this department for uh, 40 years, and I've been at Harvard. This is my 47th year at Harvard. And besides being an anthropologist and a psychiatrist who does global health and social medicine, I am a China scholar. So the way we'll go through things is to tell you about our social technology for global aging research program, give you the background of it. Um, I'll allow uh, um, uh, Fawaz Hubble and Hung Tu Chun to get us into the details of both the approach and the uh, collaborations involved. And um, Eric and Hung Tu will illustrate as well uh, projects. Um, Eric Krakauer leading one of the projects on um, palliative care in China. So if we can have the next. Slide, please. We usually think of the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine's involvement, deep involvement, uh, because of um, uh, Paul Farmer and many others with Haiti and Africa. But actually, the first major set of involvements the department has had over time has been with China, and they have continued up to the present. And much of that has had to do with me. I had two stints at Harvard. Um, if we can go back to, uh, please go back to the, yes, to that slide. Um, one from 1970 to 76, and then from 1982 to the present. Um, from 69 to 70, 1975 and 77 to 78, I conducted the first ethnography of Taiwan's healthcare system. That's a period of time during which um, it was not possible for an American to do research in China because until 1972, we didn't have relationships with China following uh, the um, 1949 and the, uh, the victory of the Chinese Communist Party in China. Uh, but um, Taiwan was a place where a lot of research on Chinese communities was carried out. And that's where I started my own research. In 1974, for the Fogarty International Center and the NIH, I uh, led a major conference, the first major conference on medicine in Chinese societies. And that was published by the NIH and is still available today. In 1980, my first book, Patients and Healers in the Context of Culture was published and was the first example of how an ethnography of a healthcare system, in this instance, Taiwan, gave a radically different uh, perspective 
from medical anthropology than the usual public health perspective on a medical system. Those sets of publications in, in, in included a 1981 book that I did with a teacher of mine, the great um, Taiwanese psychiatrist, Sung Yi Lin, called Normal and Abnormal Behavior in Chinese Culture. And following those academic research projects came in the department a series of uh, postdoctoral fellowships um, from the Freeman Foundation and the Fogarty International Center. Uh, and these postdoctoral fellowships trained some of China's leading psychiatrists in Shanghai, Beijing, and Changsha, which is the capital of Hunan province. Next uh, uh, slide. Next slide. Okay. So um, at the same time that this was going on, together with my colleague in anthropology, Woody Watson, we uh, developed a anthropology program on China that trained the first set of, um, I don't know why these are skipping around. We could just stick to where they are. The first set of, um, of uh, anthropologists from China who were trained in, contempt in modern anthropology. And these are some of our alumni. These are very distinguished alumni. And, and a number of them are participating in the, in the project you're going to hear about in a second. So Jing Jun is uh, now professor of anthropology at Tsinghua, perhaps China's uh, most powerful university in Beijing, and also head of their Center for Health. Yin Yun Shang is professor of um, anthropology at uh, UCLA and head of China programs there. Han Tian Shu is um, professor of anthropology at Fudan University in Shanghai and, um, and uh, um, heads a center that directly collaborates with us on the project you will hear about. Guo Jinhua is professor at uh, Peking University of Anthropology. Zhang Min, one of our collaborators, is professor at the National Minorities University. And then the other names that you see are well-known psychiatrists and medical anthropologists who are graduates of our various programs. Um, starting in the early 2000s, um, Hung Tu Chun, as you heard, a psychologist in our department and in the de psychiatry department at, uh, at the Brigham and I, developed a project on global family care for aging, dementia, and in the setting of social change, as all of our programs are, are uh, listed. Um, and as um, part of, of that project, we had a comparative study of elder care amongst a number of Asian societies, about five different Asian societies. That was at the time that I was the William and Victor Fung director of Harvard's Asia Center. So it made a lot of sense to have a sort of comparative study. Now at about the same time, just a little later, 2011, together with a number of the people whose names, Chinese scholars I just read, we did a book called Deep China to examine what anthropology and psychiatry could tell us more broadly about Chinese society today. And then in 2018, we began the social technology for global aging and elder care in, project, in China project, or CIGA as we, as we call it, S-T-G-A. Next uh, slide, please. So this is a little bit of the background. Let me sort of start this and then I'll, I'll turn things over to um, Hung Tu Chan. So by the year 2050, most countries around the globe will have populations with more people uh, over the age of 65. Um, and um, just to give you a sense of how big a deal this is, 
in Japan in, in 2050, 40% of the population will be over 65 years of age. In China, the figure will be closer to 30%. And in our society, the United States, closer to 25%. But those are huge percentages for that age group. There'll be more people over the age of 60 than under the age of 15. And the age group of 80 and older, we don't have to, we don't have to wait for 2050 for this one, is right now the fastest growing group in the world. The trend, this trend creates huge challenges that you can think of to societies faced with providing support and health care to the growing elderly population, because older people is where there's a concentration of chronic disorders and disability. Next slide. So over 70 years of age, um, uh, people average between three to four chronic disorders per person. Over 80 years of age, most people have some limitation, such as walking, hearing, vision, balance, et cetera. And disability is common in the elderly, relating to a number of things. So that, for example, we know that um, uh, globally, uh, for people over 65 years of age, about one out of every three has a fall, experiences a fall um, every year. Most of the time, those are minor uh, experiences, but they can be major with a broken hip, broken ankle, or broken wrist, or even head injury, as an example. Um, that increasing um, uh, difficulty with mobility, disability, leads to isolation and psychological and psychiatric morbidity. Next, next slide. Well, I think that's probably all of you know that there are higher rates of depression among frail elderly and the old, but that most of this is undiagnosed and untreated and contributes to disablement. Um, suicide rates are higher amongst the elderly, especially in rural areas. And this is particularly true in the Chinese setting. And dementia is a problem, of course, that worldwide people are concerned about today. It is the most expensive health problem in the United States. And it increases rates uh, by age over 75 with the highest rates of dementia over 85 years of age. It's estimated, and this is a rough estimate, that about half of people over 85 have some degree of cognitive impairment or technically make the criteria for dementia. Next slide. So there's an opportunity for, um, for technology and there's an opportunity to put technology in a social ecology, to bring social medicine together with technology to respond to the issues I've just raised. We can think of technologies such as smartphones, sensors, robots, exoskeletons, and we can think of social technologies in a variety of ways, social, the social ecology of technologies, as paying deep attention to the community in which people live and to the actual setting, the social setting of elder care. But we have in mind more than that. So we begin with the idea of, um, of sort of an anti-colonial approach to research in which Chinese perspectives, Chinese values, and the Chinese situation begins just with um, those of us from Harvard as the centerpiece of the way that we plan and do things. So as you'll see, our emphasis is that anthropologists, physicians, engineers, and design people 
worked together right from the start and throughout on everything so that there's no dominance of one group over another. And the same with the um, involvement of Chinese and Americans, that the um, this is research in China. It's funded by the Chinese. It is carried out in the Chinese setting. And um, the importance of Chinese values, Chinese perspectives, Chinese collaborators is central to what the project is about. This is a thoroughly decolonized project. Next slide. And these are examples of some of the emerging technologies around the world that are interesting when you think of elderly and elder care. Since in China, the goal is that 90% of the elderly will age at home, that 7% will require community services, and 3%, only 3%, will require some kind of institutional framework of living, then a lot of these technologies we can think of not only for institutions like nursing homes, assisted living, or hospitals, but actually working in family settings, such as robots who can help with lifting people, which is now taking place in Japan. Next slide. And here you see some of the kinds of technologies that we're very interested in, which is assisted technologies to allow someone after a stroke or with Parkinsonism to walk. Having um, uh, um, robots who can participate in cognitive training for people who are experiencing dementia and who whose cognitive abilities improve if there can be routine training and assistance in that regard and many other examples. Next slide. So now to talk about the progress that we've made in this, I'm gonna turn things over to Hung Tu Chun. But before I begin, I want to point out that this project, Social Technology for Elder Care, um, involves six of Harvard schools. It involves the Faculty of Arts and Sciences and, the, and its um, uh, school for CS, its school for um, uh, engineering and applied science. It involves the Harvard Medical School, the Harvard School of Public Health, the Graduate School of Design, the Harvard Business School, and um, I think I've covered covered the bases there. Um, and 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 in that, it involves faculty and students with a variety of projects. Because of COVID, the American uh, investigators, the Harvard investigators, <clears throat> were not able to um, uh, to uh, be in China by and large, um, and. The research was carried out by our Chinese collaborators, but lots of plans were set in motion. And now we are anticipating getting to the field um, perhaps as early as, as, as this summer. So with that, I'll turn things over to um, Hung Tu. Hung Tu, please take yeah, it away. Yeah. Uh, Scott, can keep going, just use your slides. Uh, okay, the first thing I want to uh, report to you guys is uh, that uh, we, uh, together as a group, uh, uh, de develop a, what we call an approach, the way of doing this uh, uh, so-called social technology. Um, basically, we face uh, a number of issues in this uh, field where technology and aging uh, merge. Um, one big challenge is that uh, there are lots of uh, technology-based products and initiatives that have been developed, but uh, many of them are not uh, really uh, being used or really uh, fitting into the context of the, where the people live. 
And uh, given the advantage of our group involving many uh, anthropologists and the, and the, and the sociologists, uh, we, we want to, uh, in our uh, many projects, we emphasize on our effort to have a more comprehensive understanding of the problem and the, uh, the problem's context. Uh, and that uh, is one of the major features of our so-called social technology approach, is uh, having a more interdisciplinary kind of collaboration in understanding uh, the problem, the nature of problem and the context. And the other one is we also notice another problem is that uh, uh, the solution, once it is developed, uh, it has rarely been uh, really uh, scaled up or uh, widely adopted in the society. And that way, after our observation that uh, it requires, the solution requires another level of integration between the solution and the social systems. Uh, not only the system that provide the care, uh, and also the system that may pay for the for the care, uh, and and the policy and the promote all this thing. So the so our uh, social technology approach also has another emphasis on how to integrate between a technology related or enabled elder care solution and uh, the social systems. Uh, well, there are other features too. So we wrote this, we published this article and uh, later uh, Fawaz may tell you more about uh, uh, his view of how this social technology approach really is implemented. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this uh, collaboration, uh, we, we have very extensive collaboration. I, I, I need to share two features here. Uh, first is that most of these contacts, uh, these connections, uh, the substantial collaboration are based on uh, authors of former students who, uh, who got a either degree or some kind of fellowship training, uh, some of them really through this department. Uh, and and the, the, the second uh, group uh, of this major collaboration are those who did not get a training or degree from Harvard, but they came here as a visiting scholar. Some of them visiting this department, some of them visiting uh, somewhere else, such as uh, uh, Kennedy School, but later become a major uh, collaborator. And what I want to uh, say is that uh, uh, the, the, our, our visitors and our students on this campus, is a very, they're playing a very important role in extending our collaboration and the continuing uh, research and the project development. And next slide, please. Uh, this, uh, as I has mentioned, that uh, our we have uh, uh, collaborated with uh, within uh, Harvard. We have uh, six schools. Uh, uh, they are involved, some of faculties are involved and the students and, and the postdocs. Uh, most of them, uh, almost all of them have uh, either worked with each other or develop a, a proposal or research project on their own. And, and uh, we also have uh, a, a seminar a bi-weekly seminar with uh, that's the largest group. And uh, then uh, small groups, they have their own uh, work group meetings. And then we also have our, our organizational structure. And we got lots of support from Jen Puchetti and uh, Yolanda and other people from this department. And uh, so that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the structure we started. That's been uh, there for the past two years. And next slide, please. Uh, uh, this is uh, the first conference that we had uh, in year one. We organized the conference and there was lots of uh, uh, participation, quite a large audience. And I remember there were lots of questions coming from uh, Asia. 
uh, and one of the questions I, I still remember because I was a facilitator of that conference. Um, the, the audience asked, say, okay, you guys obviously are presenting some promising solutions, very exciting, uh, very thoughtful. But uh, once you have some solutions, how are you going to link those solutions to the uh, practitioners, the service people, or the uh, uh, elder care nursing home systems? Uh, what are that process will be? And uh, that was a very good question. That's uh, that's the in this uh, uh, current uh, world of healthcare delivery and the implementation science, that is uh, the key question. Uh, so anyway, I just want to say that uh, uh, that was uh, uh, the the response from the audience uh, indicated that uh, there's a quite a wide range of uh, interest uh, in this topic, and of course that also is a challenge: is how we can deliver the valuable uh, solutions. Uh, next slide, please. Mm. Oh, that's the, uh, the last year, the recent, recently we had another conference, and this conference was uh, uh, in collaboration with the Ministry of Civil Affairs in China. Uh, we work closely with their uh, policy research center. Uh, one thing I want to mention is that uh, uh, the conference uh, started with the idea, the whole uh, the author is very interested in working with uh, that group in Ministry of Civil Affairs because uh, they are uh, one of the largest group in China uh, that uh, is interested in addressing social and the health disparities in, in, uh, in the society. And uh, in the country where the capitalist <laughs> Uh, system developing very fast, the social disparity issue is um, or may not be always on the, on, on the center of their focus. So we uh, organized this conference, uh, but the civil affair ministry say, could you please remove the disparity, <laughs> the inequality, that the word from the title? <laughs> you can discuss, but don't put that in title. Uh, so we, you know, you, you don't see that word. Uh, uh, that uh, that meeting was uh, uh, impressive uh, because uh, uh, through the Ministry of uh, Civil Affairs, that group, uh, we have uh, we got uh, some speakers. The, they are top uh, policy researcher and also top demographer uh, from Chinese institutions, and. Uh, 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 on our side, uh, David Bloom uh, from uh, School of Public Health uh, gave an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, I remember he, at the end of his presentation, he mentioned uh, one concept. Uh, he said that well, the global aging, global population aging is a uh, reality, but uh, uh, what we do not have is uh, so-called what he called the preparedness of the population of the aging population. The lack of preparedness, not only in terms of elderly people, but also in terms of the social system that is not ready to, uh, to face this global aging reality. And I thought that was quite a, a thought provoking uh, concept. And uh, uh, Jing Jun, professor from Tsinghua University, uh, Arthur's a former student, also presented a very interesting uh, observation about uh, uh, now, right now, uh, there are many elderly people uh, to make appointment uh, to see a doctor or just simply to travel uh, to another city or to uh, visit a park, a recreational park. Uh, they need to uh, download the app and do that online. And uh, that process is almost impossible for elderly person to handle uh, if the elderly person does not live with a, a, a child or adult child or, adult, uh, or a grandchild to help uh, him or her. Uh, 
so that observation uh, say that uh, the the advance of uh, technology, digital technology, now is uh, turning into a major barrier to elderly people, and uh, the digital literacy is uh, a big challenge. And so that was very interesting. He he used a set of uh, examples to illustrate that. So that was a, a conference. Um, I think uh, uh, we should have more of this kind of conference to talk about large issues, uh, the large policy related issues, but those discussion is, should be based on uh, very concrete examples and cases. And that is the advantage we have in this group uh, uh, with this multidisciplinary uh, involvement. Next slide, please. Okay, here I just uh, uh, say a few more words that I give to uh, for words. Um, um, we have many projects, actually, there were like a 14 or 15 projects got developed in year two. And uh, here is just a sample of them. Um, uh, the projects developed from uh, the engineering school. And uh, they all have, uh, in general, I, I, it's my observation, <laughs> for us might disagree. Uh, they all have a, a general uh, style of uh, uh, collaborative work. Collaborative work in the way that they begin with, uh, because aging elder care issue is uh, new to them. And the technology is something that they're familiar with. Uh, they need to, face this uh, task of understanding what is the aging problem that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that they are interested in. And that's a learning process. And uh, they expedite uh, that learning process by using their design process, design thinking process, and uh, uh, implement that process. And that was very impressive. And uh, uh, so that is uh, one part uh, that I, I, I was impressed uh, you know, observing how engineers work. Um, uh, another set of uh, study uh, from, uh, I, I just uh, mentioned a few examples. Uh, Eric will talk about his, his project later. Um, uh, Ellen Seeley from medical school. And she uh, is an expert in the diabetes care, diabetes, diabetes prevention. Uh, in this school, in the medical school. Uh, and she observed that uh, uh, in China, there are lots of uh, diabetes uh, education programs. But uh, for the elderly people, many of them are, are, are facing the risk of the so-called pre-diabetic risk. They're not a diabetes yet, but they start to have some symptoms. And uh, uh, if, but they have very few educational programs for that, for that uh, a large population. And, and so she developed a project uh, uh, trying to use some of the uh, online education program, which is already quite mature in this country, uh, but uh, to adapt that program for the pre-diabetic uh, uh, older adults in China. Uh, and then she need to develop uh, uh, tools to understand that group. And so that is his, her, that is her work. And that's, uh, that's uh, one example uh, from medical school. And uh, uh, Sue and uh, my work uh, has more to do with how to develop a training courses for people who either uh, directly providing care to patients with uh, dementia or uh, people who uh, manage those people who provide direct care uh, with dementia. Uh, and, and those kind of training courses uh, uh, that uh, we're developing and uh, testing them in China. Uh, and so that's uh, uh, David Bloom, Winnie Yip from uh, Harvard School of Public Health. They uh, develop projects, uh, they compare uh, across countries. And uh, David is interested in how the healthcare systems, uh, elder care systems uh, are established, uh, how effective are they uh, uh, in terms of outcome, whether they're they're efficient 
uh, he, she ha he has data in from China and India and other countries. And the winner Yip is interested in uh, comparing and uh, understanding what are the successful or best practice models in terms of elder care. Um, and uh, so she uh, has sampled different models from different countries and see how they are, how they are, uh, they have successfully addressed the issue. And that is quite a, a good learning for all the students involved in the process too. And another project that we in, uh, relate to uh, understanding the, the context. And one project is a quantitative survey that we have developed. Another group uh, uh, led by Arthur Kleiman is our uh, anthropologists, uh, students and the, and the professors. And they are working on right now, I think they can put together a volume about uh, uh, their uh, initial observation and, and their analysis of uh, based on cases uh, have a relatively in-depth understanding of the elder care issues. Uh, and this is just some examples. Uh, well, I will give uh, uh, the forum to... Uh, to hold, it, hold it, before oh, you turn uh, things over, before okay. you turn things over to Voss, let me give two other examples that may help people understand better uh, the kinds of things we're doing. Hmm. So one is that the city of Shanghai um, some years ago committed itself to building elevators on five-story mm -hmm. walk-ups where many of the um, working class and poor um, uh, uh, citizens of Shanghai live in order to help the elderly uh, who otherwise couldn't um, uh, get out of their, their apartments. And they built a thousand elevators um, or they put elevators on, on a thousand buildings, and then they ran into a series of problems, which is where we have come in to examine uh, things and like the problems were that they asked people to contribute to the funding of that and clearly hadn't thought about the fact that elderly on the first floor and elderly on the fifth floor might have different views of uh, how much they would be willing to contribute toward those elevators and their upkeep. Uh, uh, et cetera. And so that's an example of the of, of, a, of a technology put into place without thinking about what its social context was about, leading to a set of social problems that have to be resolved for that technology to be expanded. Another, maybe even better example in some ways of what we have in mind is the following. At a particular stage, our Chinese collaborators showed, showed elderly women in Shanghai uh, who were living, um, who all of whom had mobility problems and were isolated in high rise buildings. They were shown um, uh, some of the wonderful things that Connor Walsh has developed with exoskeletons that allow people who have a mobility problem to walk. So if you have a stroke, you have a, um, uh, uh, your post Parkinsonism, um, you need assistance with your, with walking. And um, what it looks like a thick pair of pants tied to a battery and a, a motor allows you to um, to uh, to walk, to actually walk. And the, these elderly people shown this in China said, "Well, that's great, but we would never use these because no matter how good they were, so dangerous is it to cross the street in Shanghai because of the chaotic traffic. We would never, at our age, trust ourselves." to use this. But what we would really want from you is if you could get at any one time, five, six, seven of us, all of whom are isolated with mobility problems, if you could get us together and get us safely back and forth to a tea house where we could enjoy ourselves just once a week or so, that would make all the difference in the quality of our lives. And so that became then the basis for our um, social technology, how to solve that problem, not for five or six elderly, not for 60 elderly, not for 600 elderly, but for 60,000 elderly. How would you, or 600,000 elderly, how would you actually go about um, uh, 
making it feasible for that to happen. Sorry for uh, for us. I interrupt in order to give some examples. Please take it away. Okay, go out. I'm saying I need to share my slide uh, on two. Can I do that? Yes. Scott. Yes, Scott I can. Help us with that. Yes, I can. Yes, yes. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, very good. So just give me a second here to get them out. Uh, let's see if we can share. Yes, we can. All right, excellent. Uh, So let me start by saying something about myself here. I'm uh, Fawaz Habal. I'm, I work in the School of Engineering Applied Sciences. And uh, the initial thing I want to mention is when Arthur and uh, Hong to talk with me about uh, joining this, uh, I start thinking like, what would a engineer physicist be doing work in something that sounds like a uh, very much embedded in society and what needs to be done. But very quickly, I remind myself that uh, really engineer's job is to be creating things for society. It's not meant to be doing, uh, you know, just answering, uh, uh, writing homeworks and answering them and uh, doing uh, mathematics. So I was extremely enthusiastic, extremely excited about working there. And I brought some people with me from the engineering school, or, uh, Connor Welsh in particular, some other people too, and a bunch of students. And what you'll see here is mostly collection of ideas and thoughts that came from the initial work with uh, Arthur and Hantu, and also the work of the students. Uh, I gave them all the credit. So the work started by saying, uh, how can we create interventions that create better quality for life, for life for the elderly people? I mean, we could say in general, but really we're emphasizing elderly people. So that's kind of the work. And what we emphasize is that we, man we need to maintain social ties and include and be in contact with the world uh, and be part of life, meaning create a sense of belonging, and a certain sense of independence for the elderly and contribute contribute to society, create self-fulfillment. Okay, so individuals must participate in groups, must be able to feel that they are part of society. Those elderly, if they were left on the side, uh, that could really be the biggest issue that they will, they will face. And many of them do face that. We need to avoid creating burden and making them proud of what they're doing and how they're doing it. So there are quite a bit of work we had to understand about the elderly and their needs and what they need to do. So for me as a engineer, as a uh, designer, and uh, to some degree, I'm, I do quite a bit of work in uh, right now with social issues. I look at the issues as uh, systems and everything around me seems to be systems. Systems means that the, things are made of component and processes and relationships. And these systems end up being, uh, you know, uh, very complex in the sense that there are many components in the system, they interact and they change in time, which means that they have dynamics. And there are something we call it feedback loops. And when there are complex systems, we don't have time to talk about it in details, but they emerge, interesting things emerge, you don't expect, and sometimes they self-organize. So given these, uh, we find some of these also in physical system, we find some of these uh, exist in technology too, but human are, in my opinion, is the essence of complexity. Without uh, human uh, being part of the system, system could be simply complicated, which means something goes wrong, we can fix it. When you have complex systems, things get interactive to the degree that you can't simply take a uh, reductionist approach and take every piece of the system and try to solve it by itself. You have to, as much as possible, you have to include all the elements, at least understand the elements, if not include them in the solutions. So 
when I look at systems, I think of it as physical system, physical health, and mental health. And I see tremendous connection between the two. And the interaction between the two really what's uh, interesting and it requires to look at both, not only solve mechanical issues, and but also see how they interact with the mental issues. So for instance, social connectedness, re, uh, interact with mobility, as Arthur mentioned, things related to physical and mental health, also related to safety and daily activities and leisure. Mobility could be also part of what we call uh, thing that we can work on. So there is the system has many components and the component interact quite a bit. So aging, I believe aging is a complex system. It's embedded in culture and knowing, understanding what the culture we're dealing with in this particular case, China, is absolutely important and has to, the context is crucial. So all the time the students have to try to understand issues related to culture when they're trying to think of a solution, figure out how is can work in particular cultures. So I leave this one here, meaning that the interaction between these components are really nonlinear and there are time delays and stuff like that. So, so basically we'll, in social technology, what we I learned, start to learn working with Arthur and Hantu and the group is that, uh, of course, multidisciplinary collaboration is a must. We have to include social scientists, engineers, healthcare uh, experts. We need to include, make sure that we have ethical and humanistic standards, improve social systems, and uh, look into promoting social justice. This is extremely important. Inequality is, is uh, uh, elderly people, very quickly face this issue here of inequality. And we need to be able to foster uh, social integration, such as the elderly persons will be able to integrate uh, and be able to feel contributing to the society. Uh, last but not least is there is a global benefit. What we're doing is focus on China, but I believe it has global benefit. Definitely a lot of what we're doing can be utilized and be benefiting uh, in in the United States, but we have to make sure that we can really still include the social uh, aspect and the changes in in culture. So, the created the team created uh, was a group of social scientists, humanists, engineers, and designers. Designers here is not only making things, but also the people who can understand and analyze the root causes and figure out what do we do to take a system from an inferior state to a superior state? So as uh, Arthur and uh, Hantu mentioned, we started by having a lot of discussions and included a lot of people uh, from many schools uh, and uh, at Harvard and outside Harvard too. And we came up to some kind of understanding that ended up being written in this uh, article here uh, which talks about interdisciplinary approach to improving care for the elderly. And uh, what's interesting about this article is it gives us the framework from which we started and guidelines from which we started doing our work. It made it easier for us to interact, it made it easier for us to understand each other. So we have created steering committee and number of activities. I'm citing here 13 activities. There are far more broadly inside every activity. There are several uh, in the group that I'm working with. I talk here about visual pattern recognition technology and applications in health, but it's really far more than that. We looked at things and I'll describe some of it later. We looked at things related to mobility and related to <clears throat> what, what goes on home. And what you see in our discussions in general is there is a, these projects are not insular. They are really quite a bit interacting with each other and trying to figure out how to take advantage of knowledge in different areas. This is kind of a group that uh, we meet uh, more or less every week uh, and uh, Arthur and uh, Hantu join us. Uh, and uh, we are very democratic in our views. Uh, we have students, we have postdocs, we have professors, and we interact uh, you know, equally. 
this is a picture came mostly from taking uh, Zoom slides, and uh, you could see here that's a normally the group that meet together. Some show up, sometimes they don't. Uh, Professor Dong sometimes shows up with us, and uh, Sue Levkov uh, shows up uh, occasionally, and uh, and her team join us. So it's quite a lively group uh, trying to understand uh, how we can contribute to this kind of problem. I want to emphasize some things. When you talk about design, it's really important to emphasize the design principles. What we want to do at the end is create desirable, usable, and useful devices, that's for sure, or interventions. But we have to respect diversity. We have to create something simple and intuitive to use. And we need to be able to communicate our ideas to both the elderly and the caregivers and make sure that they can really use them and understand them. And we need to understand what they want. Safety, of course, goes without uh, uh, as a priority. Uh, we need to create positive emotions and co-design with users. The last one is extremely important. We got to do co-design with users. And users here are both the elderly and the caregivers and their families. So these are really principles. Always we try to remind each other to observe and when something uh, proposed, we try to see if it fits what we are claiming here we need to do doing. The general methodology, there are two steps. One of them is, uh, I'll describe here, one is to start looking at the literature, review what's been done, identify what are the trends, the meta trends, do system map. System map is probably the most tedious and most difficult thing to do, where we look at all the points that interact with a particular case and see how these are interacting and how these uh, feed into each other. We identify stakeholders, user interviews is very important, and then we get some insights. When we get the insight, we put some problem statement, and I'll show you one as an example. Then we start talking about possible intervention, prototyping, and then user testing. Unfortunately, we've been very weak on user testing, partially because of the COVID and partially because China is a little far, and partially because the work hasn't been finished. So we are really still in the so-called initial prototyping stages, uh, but we still have quite a bit of promising outcomes. So here is an example of problem statement. And this is second element, very important element in the methodology. So a problem statement is try to describe everything you want to do. So in this case here, we're looking at a particular interactions where encourage people to be together and work together. So we say, how might we re redesign the elderly Chinese meal system to promote agency safety and social relations for the older adults? So clearly we are emphasizing the social aspects here, but also how you design something like uh, a meal system might require quite a bit of technology. In fact, it does. So let me move forward here and describe some of our activities. Uh, this issue around designing meal system is not uh, the only one. We did uh, quite a bit of work on many things. This is a... Uh, <laughs> an eye test for all kinds of activities we did. We talked about emptiness. We talked about aging at home, smart aging. We talked about uh, you know, how we can have a cultural, physical, cognitive, emotional resources, and they are all interacting together to create a better quality of life. And uh, the, the idea of showing this is not to get you to read everything here, but really to understand that we are working on quality of life, driving social change, social interactions, and social dynamics are absolutely important. So as we look for social dynamics, we measure things and we try to figure out how to create things that enable better social dynamics. For instance, retirement would be one or caregiving or palliative care and so on. On the social interactions, we look at uh, loss of cognitive capacity. We look at loss of physical capacity. Some of it in my group, some of it in outside group, but we interact with those people as much as we can, because as I said before, all of these are interactive elements. So here is an example of something uh, my group and I worked on is uh, we created a very small camera, the same camera in your cell mobile phone. 
And this camera, instead of only taking pictures of the object, it also analyzed the material object. So it can be used for early detection and monitoring of diseases for elderly because this camera, everyone has a phone, everyone can take a picture and everyone can therefore obtain analysis of some subject of interest to them. It employs some nanotechnologies. These are thousands of a hair, 1,000 of a hair or less. And uh, they are working like antennas that can detect color and uh, give us some information about, uh, with machine learning, we get information about the subject matter. So it's still in prototyping stage. We still need quite a bit of work to create uh, these uh, different colors. As you can see here, we're not talking about three colors. We're talking many different colors. And these colors enable us to create spectrum uh, spectrums of the subject. So here is another one. It says, how can we improve the quality of life of the elderly by helping them to prevent and manage osteoarthritis, which ultimately lets them stay socially and physically active. So this disease is affecting ability of walking, which affects the social aspect and of course the physical aspects. Physical like, for instance, simple things like moving around the house, being able to dress, being able to move over to, to do their daily uh, 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 activities. So this social the impact goes from preventive to post-care. And there are social situations and there are educational things we can deal with. You could see how the scope here is quite broad and you can, believe it or not, you can use technology for every one of these uh, boxes. So, uh, Osteoarthritis is a common disease and most elderly end up having it. And the question is, can we prevent it? Maybe, maybe not, but can we reduce it? Can we make things with less pain? Can we make things with uh, their situation be improved? Can you alert them upfront to things such as prevention can be, uh, uh, be a, a starting point uh, rather than being surprised by situations that uh, can be grave later. So we look at preventive ideas, uh, physical products, digital products. We looked at uh, things like assistive technologies. We looked at education material, uh, physical therapy, uh, education material we emphasize and also assistive technologies. So a lot of interviews with nurses, with elderly people, with doctors, and we obtain a lot of information around uh, what goes on in their heads, what goes on, what do they feel, how do they understand things. Uh, once we've done that, uh, we emphasize work, talking with uh, clinicians because we are far away from that knowledge and uh, obtain quite a bit of an understanding of uh, what can be done. So, Basically, the outcome of the project today, at least, uh, we created analog and digital toolkits that makes people aware of the issues. And you may say this is simple. Okay, what is a toolkit? But make it socially attractive, make it socially embedded in what they're doing, make it uh, useful and uh, friendly is uh, not a trivial talk. You really need to understand quite a bit about it. So as I said before, the user targets are patient and elderly uh, givers, uh, uh, caregivers. And uh, the platform having to be physical, meaning uh, items that they can, booklets and calendars, for instance, and also digital where we created many programs uh, that can be used by elderly on their phone without downloading and doing all of the things that uh, people have to do. So example of kids could be a calendar uh, that people normally give gifts to each other. Talking about things, we created these apps, creating pathways, uh, joint fully uh, osteoarthritis, uh, which describes things and so on and so forth. Anyway, there were several apps that being still in the works right now and uh, not fully been done. Here is an example of what you see in an app. Uh, uh, make it joyful, make it uh, helping managing life at the same time, creating maybe some exercises that can relieve, uh, relieve the pain. 
At the same time, we work with uh, Connor Welsh to look into things uh, related to, uh, you know, physical uh, devices such as they can help in creating uh, uh, monitoring movement, creating less uh, pain, and helping people moving around. Of course, data is very important. We looked at things in homes. We have the home environment uh, works. Uh, where does the life work? Where does the life lives? Uh, where do the family do their interactions, living spaces? And we tried very hard with uh, to figure out how we can monitor things inside homes and help understanding and uh, finding uh, these kind of solutions. So. As you can see, things get uh, quite a bit elaborate and uh, require quite of uh, uh, sensors and information gathering. But at the end, we come with answers, and the answers could be things like, uh, you know, uh, people can we emphasize that people of not a lot of experience be able to use them and uh, be comfortable with them. So I want to thank you for listening, and I want to say that this is very brief summary and very uh, of many activities and potential interventions. And I want also to say that there are significant number of researchers, educators, and students who contributed to our work over the last couple of years or so. And I want to thank uh, everyone here who contributed and everyone who is listening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fawaz. Um, Eric, are you here your sides too, right? Sure, I can share them. I know, Let's see which is the right one. Which is the right one, yeah. Okay, shall I proceed? Please. Okay, well, first of all, um, I, I apologize. I think I sent out my link to some other colleagues. Uh, I was not supposed to do that. So there's probably several Eric Krakauers who are uh, tuning in. Apologize for that. Um, I want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Scott Podolsky for inviting me, and of course, Professor Kleinman, Professor Habal, and, and Professor Chung for inviting us to participate. Uh, I include Dr. Jimong Jia, Jia Jimong. From University of Toronto, who's uh, with whom I work uh, every step of the way on this project. I'm um, I'm an internist by training and a palliative care specialist at Massachusetts General Hospital, and I direct the program in global palliative care at Harvard Medical School, Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. Um, and it was uh, it's been a great privilege to to join this group. I like to begin my talks with patients. Um, you see here an older couple, elderly couple. Um, they're uh, often, uh, the, the children now more and more in China have left the home, whereas their traditional responsibility was to take care of their elder parents, a uh, very uh, important traditional value, which I'll get to. Now they're very often going off to work in cities and sort of older people or uh, at home alone, sometimes uh, completely alone if one spouse has died. And as Professor Kleinman mentioned, older people often have chronic illnesses, uh, many times more than one chronic illness. And those chronic illnesses often have symptoms, whether it's pain or shortness of breath, uh, also other uh, 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 symptoms such as uh, uh, depression, anxiety, dementia. So um, we, I've had the privilege of working with uh, uh, the uh, professor uh, Jun Jing from Tsinghua University, who's uh, uh, a professor of anthropology and who directs the public health uh, program at the at the uh, Tsinghua University. And now our wonderful colleague, uh, Dr. Ning Hong at Peking Union Medical College Hospital, with whom we work very closely. And now I have to figure out how to advance the slides. They're not advancing. Uh, let's see. Eric, if you just go to the PowerPoint, it should be able to advance through there. Or if you hit either, either the forward arrow or the down arrow, or on your mouse. Yeah, I'm doing all those things. Let me see. You may have to touch the slide first before you can move forward. 
Okay, uh, let me try this again. Apologies. Okay, now it's working. Um, so uh, after discussion with uh, all the, the colleagues that have been introduced, um, we took as our goal for this particular project to assist Chinese partners to design and implement palliative care training, clinical services, and technologies that respond to the needs of China's people based on social science and clinical research. I should probably back up and say briefly how we define palliative care in the West or how WHO, the World Health Organization defines it, which is quite uh, most simply put, the prevention and relief of suffering of any kind, be it physical or psychological or social or spiritual, um, when uh, related to serious health problems. So prevention, relief of suffering of any kind associated with serious health problems. So of course, we need to know what the health problems are um, and what the types of suffering are. And there are data on that that we base our work on. Our objectives uh, are the following and have been the following since we began working together about, I guess it's a year and a half ago. One, was to create three levels of curricula, palliative care, PC is palliative care curricula uh, and training for China, uh, adapted for China. The first is a basic level training, which uh, we uh, agreed should be uh, required for all medical students uh, and all primary care doctors. Most patients who need palliative care are at home, they're not in hospitals, and they typically want to stay at home if possible. So uh, a lot, a lot of, primary, uh, of palliative care is not complicated. It's easy to do with basic training. It's easy for primary care providers to, to provide basic palliative care with, uh, with, with basic training and basic uh, materials. And this can, if this is available at community level, patients are able to stay home. And I'll say more about that. They don't have to go back to uh, the referral centers to travel, as, which as we've heard is often difficult. Intermediate level palliative care training for all physicians who specialize in fields uh, where there's care for people with serious health problems. So oncologists, hematologists, geriatricians, internists, cardiologists, et cetera. Uh, we, we aim to create that kind of curriculum as well. And ultimately there needs to be teachers, implementers, palliative care teachers, implementers, and leaders. Uh, in other words, palliative care specialists who can uh, implement programs, lead the programs, advise the Ministry of Health, um, and be the teachers. These are, again, some of our long, that's a longer term objective. What we have done is to create a clinical manual of palliative care for China. It was written in, in English, but adapted uh, and, uh, for China uh, and translated into Chinese. And uh, one of the fascinating parts of this for me was into Chinese characters. So people suffer differently in different places. People don't suffer uh, the same way in Boston as they do in rural China or in Malawi or in Ecuador. Um, and how people suffer is related, of course, to the spectrum of illnesses that uh, exist in any location, and that varies by geography, to the availability of preventive services and treatment but also based on culture, uh, based on how people understand health and illness and disability and dying and death and afterlife. So you can't just take what we do for palliative care in Boston and plop it into uh, Chengdu or, or rural China and have it be uh, optimal for the local population. And the term palliative care itself 
wouldn't have any, it barely has meaning for most people in English. Most people don't know what it is and we have to explain it. How, how could we say it in Chinese? So after months and months of discussion, this is how it was translated. Uh, and for, uh, with apologies for my terrible Chinese pronunciation, it's Huan Hu Iliao, which, and correct me if I'm wrong, literally means something like healthcare for comfort and harmony because we found that the concept of harmony, harmony within oneself, with others and with the environment was so important. So uh, all by way of saying adaptation of palliative care for China was, was a major part of our uh, objectives. Then strengthening palliative care services at Peking Union Medical College Hospital, which is uh, one of the most prestigious and prominent hospitals in the country, uh, and which has an amazing palliative care uh, uh, advocate and leader who's trying, who was already trying to uh, 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 build services there. Assist with development and refining of national, provincial, and municipal palliative care policies and strategic plans. In other words, provide the expertise that doesn't yet uh, exist commonly in China in uh, clinical aspects and public health aspects of palliative care. And now I'm once again having trouble advancing slides. You defer to our engineer for a while, so or it sounds like you just pull back and sounds like we need more uh, social technology here. Uh, there we go. Okay, I don't know why it doesn't work. Um, assist with design and implementation of model district and community level palliative care services. So ultimately, as I mentioned, the services need to get into the community level, but uh, we think that there needs to be always supervision uh, from higher levels. And so we're beginning at a high level um, uh, to build up palliative care uh, services and training capability at major at a major referral center. And so one of the projects we have in mind is to then expand into the community near Peking Union Medical College Hospital uh, uh, to, to pilot community level services. Uh, I mentioned the importance of uh, in Chinese culture, and again, I'm, I don't profess to have expertise in this, but many on this call do. Uh, and my understanding is that so-called filial piety, or uh, uh, I won't bother to try to pronounce it in Chinese, um, is extremely important and defined as obedience and respect for elders and also taking care of elders. And this, uh, in, in the last 40 years, since major life-sustaining treatments, life-sustaining technologies have been developed, there's often an understanding that family, younger, uh, that, that, that children and grandchildren have to demand all life-sustaining tr treatments, even when they're very disabled and very sick or near death. And so we thought that there needs to be a, uh, a rethinking of Xiao uh, Xuan, uh, because sometimes filial piety may entail protecting uh, frail and uh, uh, seriously ill or dying elders from invasive life sustaining treatments. Some of the social technologies for palliative care that we've been working on include adult incontinence management kits that are both biodegradable and inexpensive. Uh, incontinence is an enormous burden for family caregivers uh, and uh, adult diapers, although they're available, they tend to be prohibitively expensive for the poor and, um, uh, and bad for the environment. So is it possible to create biodegradable, inexpensive, adult diapers or adult incontinence management kits that could greatly reduce burdens for family caregivers. Uh, opioid access to uh, opioids like morphine for pain relief are crucial. And there's a lot of reluctance in many countries around the world. Uh, I think especially in East Asia where opioids have been used uh, for, uh, well, by Europeans 
uh, as, uh, as, a, as, a, as a means of colonial oppression, really. Uh, so there's an antipathy, as, uh, which has made, been made worse by uh, the, uh, uh, the substance use disorder epidemic uh, throughout the world. Uh, so the opioids and other controlled medicines need to be kept safe. How can we do that? How can we monitor uh, exactly what happens to every milligram of morphine? So we've been working on a smart lockbox that's uh, cheap enough to be installed uh, in even at the community level in community health centers and safe enough so that thieves can't, can't steal it. And then we already saw a picture from Japan of a bedside lift. But is it possible to, to design and create a bedside lift that's cheap enough and easy, uh, to, easy enough to move around that can be made available for poor uh, people in rural China and other uh, 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 resource limited areas that enables patients to get out of bed and into a wheelchair, into a chair and back into bed uh, without uh, uh, injuring the backs of caregivers who may not be able to lift them. We've also had some success with our uh, uh, research and, and publishing um, on uh, uh, where we, we've got studies underway on effectiveness of our palliative care training, uh, and I'll, uh, uh, which has already begun, preferences for end of life care and decision-making in China, and cost effectiveness of palliative care integrated with specialist and primary care. And finally, uh, some accomplishments, even in the, the 18 months we've been working together. We, as I mentioned, uh, we led adaptation uh, and translation of a, of a manual of palliative care and also of a basic curriculum that uh, uh, already exists. And we, it has already been uh, piloted in a large training held by Peking Union Medical College uh, Hospital a palliative care unit for 10 hospitals in Zhejiang province uh, several months ago using the basic curriculum. We assisted with an international palliative care congress that was held by uh, Professor uh, uh, Jing Jun and his team at Tsinghua and uh, with a conference at Peking Union Medical College Hospital, which also was the launch of a center for palliative care, a center for palliative medicine that we helped uh, to create with uh, Dr. Ning Hong, And then publications and Dr. Jia Jimang is really our, our, our research and publication uh, point person and leader. Our first paper is already in press, association between primary decision maker and care intensity among patients with advanced cancer in mainland China. And this very much gets to this uh, issue of Xiao Shuan or filial piety. And uh, more studies are underway Dr. Jiaji Meng has published many already on end of life care for the Chinese diaspora. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Scott, why don't you, uh, do you have any questions that we can respond to? Sure, I certainly invite our attendees to present any questions as well. Um, and thank you. It's, it's remarkable to hear all these perspectives being put to the, these important issues. I guess, Arthur and, and everyone, what are the advantages, the challenges of doing this work in, in China, say, than, than doing this in the, the United States? Well, first of all, I mean, the you're speaking to a China scholar, so my interest is in China, not necessarily in the United States. And okay. But I would like to see developments in China be useful in the United States. I think that's the case. Um, the great um, uh, ad advantage for us is the interdisciplinarity in a... Uh, actual functional setting. So we didn't talk about funding, but the funding for this project comes from the Jiangsu Institute of Industrial Technology. This is like in a uh, provincial NSF in China's second wealthiest province, where the capital, uh, where the uh, large city is Nanjing. And um, they have supported not just us, but a center in China, which allows us to directly uh, engage in research, even when we're not there with our, with our collaborators uh, doing things. Um, we have, um, you know, I've 
devoted my whole career to studying health and medicine and Chinese culture. And um, this issue of the elderly is particularly acute in East Asia and in China in particular. And I think it is an incredibly important issue. Now, how generalizable is it in global health to other areas? China is the world's second largest economy, but it has a great deal of health and social disparity. Um, just as we do. And so one of the interesting uh, things about this study is the that our, our quantitative survey and ethnography of both um, um, what problems the elderly face in a particular district and what um, uh, resources they have available to set up sort of the framework for what we can do because of what they do need involves both rural and urban settings. And that's a great comparison to be able to see a setting that has both rural and urban elderly and to be able to uh, think about how to deal with the disparities that they experience. And that, that's basically why we're working with the Ministry of Civil Affairs. So the Ministry of Civil Affairs is. Um, uh, the most social justice oriented of, of China's ministries. They have responsibility for the disabled, for the poor, for the um, uh, for minority groups. And, um, uh, and their concerns are, um, are to find solutions that fit into local context and really help people. Here's an example. So um, in rural China, if someone requires an electric wheelchair, it makes no sense really to have it because it can't be fixed when it breaks down. Um, but what can substitute for an electric wheelchair is a mechanical wheelchair that requires only five to 10 pounds of pressure exerted by the person sitting in it or by a caregiver walking along with such a person. A mechanical chair that can be fixed easily by people who are accustomed to fixing tractors and fixing cars, that can go up a hill, that can go over railroad crossings, that can allow a person to be alive and active in society. And then I think, you know, that raises a question for us in the United States, which is, is there, a, is there something from that that we can take back to the US? So, for example, in our department, obviously, one of the key issues is accompaniment and um, the use of community health workers. Well, China actually is the place where this first got going through barefoot doctors. And yet that system broke down for a variety of historical and social reasons. Could one redevelop uh, community care processes that would help be the elderly, and that's one of the things that we're yeah. we're 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 looking at. The whole idea of accompaniment, which so filled up Paul's life, is really caught in up in the in the issue that that was raised by Eric of filial reverence, of filial piety. China has gone through a revolution in its culture. What used to be the central principle of society which was the family, hierarchical relationships, care of the elderly, has now been redeveloped in such a way through the uh, current phase of uh, neoliberal capitalism that horizontal relationships, conjugal relationships, relationships with friends are at least as important, if not more important, than vertical relationships. And this has changed the nature of caregiving in Chinese society. So our project takes into account all of those things. And I find it at the end of a career in which I've devoted over 50 years of my life to health and illness in Chinese society, I find it an extraordinary uh, project. Now, let me say, well, let me have a coda to this. Um, uh, the China, China's place in the world and its relations with the US 
have changed radically since I began my work in 1969. Okay. Today we have, and the Chinese have abetted this, constructed each other as adversaries, China and the United States. There was actually, just as an aside, no reason to do this. We were competitors. We didn't have to be adversaries. But nonetheless, we are in a situation of an adversarial situation at this time. Seems to me one of the most important things, much like the era of the Cold War and US relations with the Soviet Union, is for scientists, physicians, people involved in humanitarian assistance to be engaged in keeping those relationships going in spite of what's happening at government levels. And so one of the deep commitments I have is to keep work going with Chinese colleagues, even at a different difficult time in terms of international politics. Will this change things? Probably not. But is it important in terms of our human engagement with each other, our concern for care? Yeah, it really is. Thank you, Arthur. Any of your colleagues wanted to answer that? Um, Scott, if I may, uh, it's Eric Krakauer again. You know, I, I work in multiple places in Africa and Asia and, and even in the Americas. And I guess I've been more and more impressed with the Euro-American arrogance that we always know how to do things best and we need to deliver our enlightened ideas to the rest of the world. But as Professor Kleiman was saying, um, you know, particularly in light of all of the problems we have in Western culture, including, uh, 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 well, I won't go into them all, you know what they are. It's, there's a lot that can be learned from uh, the cultural values that uh, that often were dismissed since the colonial era. And, uh, you know, this really struck me as a palliative care physician in the COVID epidemic. I was on our palliative care uh, COVID team at Mass General, and it was one elder after another from nursing homes who were dying of, of, uh, of COVID. Uh, because we didn't provide the uh, the preventive measures in time, we weren't taking adequate care of them. So yes, filial piety doesn't have the same meaning uh, uh, in China as it did before the revolution. But you know, it, do we a society that's constructed mainly to promote commerce as opposed to a society that's also constructed to to care for the vulnerable? Um, and the, those who would otherwise be marginalized, that's something we can learn from other cultures. Uh, how, take it, the meaning of, of, uh, of, of illness and death and dying and, uh, and respect for elders. These are cultural lessons that we can learn from, uh, from other cultures. The idea of reverse innovation is also very important as Professor Kleinman mentioned. We, you know, the, 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 uh, the, this, the uh, palliative care organizations, uh, networks that include community health workers to visit patients at home and report back to community health centers. This is a model that's underdeveloped and much needed and could be of great use both in urban and rural United States. So there's many, there's many values, I think, for, for, for this kind of work for the United States. And I hope the NIH will appreciate that when we look for grant money from the NIH. Thanks. Thanks I mean, the other part of the other response to you, Scott, is that at the policy level, and this is what Winnie Yip and David Bloom do, uh, and Ann Kleinman as well, at the policy level, comparative policy is very important. And we have a chance of looking at comparative policy for one of the great issues of our time, care for the aged across radically different societies. And I think there's a advantage to that. And I know, I know we're at time, but uh, for one more question perhaps, and this, this goes from a the general question to a more specific, this is asked by Isaac Chua. How would you describe the role of telemedicine in geriatric and palliative care delivery in China? And what public health efforts would need to be made in order to ensure equitable telehealth delivery in China? Yeah, 
This is a great topic, and um, there is a lot of uh, telemedicine going on in China, and you can look at it in the same way that you look at it in the United States. There are benefits and there are problems with this. One of the benefits has been that um, uh, in a time in which uh, you know China's gone through right now, China's going through an incredible crisis with COVID. So the Chinese policy, obviously, for COVID was a failed policy. It was to exclude COVID, zero COVID from the country. That, that created major economic and political issues for the society. All of a sudden, all the um, approaches, the, the, all the, the dimensions of a control approach were released. And now China has been flooded and it's been claimed that in the last two months, perhaps 80% of the Chinese have developed COVID, okay? An, an incredible um, outbreak of COVID. But, uh, and so within the context of that, just think of that, how, how, how different that is uh, right now than the experience that we're having, although we're still having 500 deaths uh, every day in, in the United States. Um, there is the chance to look at again, where do the elderly fit into this? Where does elder care fit into this? And it is indeed the elderly who represent the great tragedy in Chinese society, because during this period of control, um, there was a sort of slow and, and, and not very um, uh, systematic for, for a society that so much uh, systemized control, a response in terms of vaccinating the elderly. And uh, only about 70 to 80% of the elderly had um, vaccination uh, of one vaccination, few of them had uh, uh, boosters, and they are the ones who are now suffering the greatest with the highest rates of uh, of mortality and morbidity in that setting. Now, we also have had experience with that. So it's that comparative issue of, for the next epidemic, for the next pandemic, how are we going to proceed? How are we going to proceed in a world in which 40% of a society, as will be the case in, J in Japan in 2050, is over 65 years of age? What will it be for our society when a quarter of the population is over 65 years of age? These are the kinds of issues we're trying to bring together social approaches with technological approaches to provide means of thinking of how to adapt to a time that is going to be very different from the times that we've been through. Fawaz. Fawaz, did you have a response? Yes, yes. So I was on mute. Uh, so I, I think the, I want to echo what uh, Arthur said and Eric, uh, I, I fully agree with everything being said. I think my, my, my addition point is that we look at things in a very superficial way. We look at things as if they are, uh, can be reduced to sub component and we handle everyone independently and we think we're going to solve it this way. It's not solvable this way. When Arthur mentions things about the COVID, yes, there is social aspect for sure. And we almost completely uh, ignored it. And, uh, you know, there is also, we emphasize the medical aspect as if this is the only issue. The virus is the issue. But there are social aspects, there are economic aspects, there are political aspects. There is, of course, technical aspects. And they all were put only on one emphasis, which is, can I deliver the virus? Can I kill this virus somehow? Can I stop the virus? Can I immune people from uh, getting the, the disease? But the, the reality is uh, the things is a very complex system and you can't only touch it this way. We don't want to learn how to solve problem in a, in, in a broad way, in a complete way. We want to only address it from one perspective and that's really the essence of the problem. Yeah. Well, it sounds like those weekly meetings must be remarkable for these kinds of discussions and, and really grateful that you're able to share that you're, you're thinking out loud with all of us today um really the, you know what, what happens when you bring the, the, just the you know, variety of perspectives to such an important problem as you say and a looming problem it's going to get a looming social concern 
So thank you very much to, to, to all of you. And um, for our audience, uh, please join us next in, on February 22nd uh, with Stephanie Russo Carroll, who will be speaking on uh, through the uh, Joe Gan and the HUNAP program through Healing Through Data. Uh, so thank you to everyone here today. Thank you, Scott, for having us. Bye-bye. Thank you for having us. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks to everybody. Bye-bye. Arthur, was thank you so much. And Amy, as always, thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Some really good questions at the end there. Yeah, they were good questions. Great. That's nice. All right, Arthur, be well and heal up from that surgery. <laughs> Take care. Yeah.